Dishonored 2's Clockwork Mansion is one of the most intricately designed video game levels ever created. Imagine the series trademark expansive environments, but with an additional layer of complexity in the form of areas you can actually change the layout of, combined with a despicable villain and plenty of other clever flourishes. It is genius in so many ways, and in this video I'm going to chat more about why it's an experience of the highest quality. Before I do, here's the background behind the mission. Empress Emily Caldwin finds herself on the run after which Delilah Copperspoon seizes the throne of Dunwall and turns her father and protector Corvo Atano to stone. She is then gifted powers by the mysterious outsider, meets new ally Megan Foster and begins her quest to bring down her enemy and regain power. To strengthen her cause, Emily embarks on a rescue of genius scientist and close friend Anton Sokolov. Sokolov has been locked away by madcap inventor Kiran Jindosh and his army of clockwork soldiers, and your objective is to bring him home and neutralise Jindosh by whatever means necessary. We've got to find out where Sokolov's being held and bring the old man back alive. Rescue one genius and cage the other before he creates an army of clockwork soldiers. There are several areas you need to work your way through prior to reaching the mansion itself, but they're nothing overly special so we won't dwell on them here. There is, however, one thing worth mentioning. You have a choice between sneaking your way onto a carriage and riding it to your destination, or using Emily's powers to get there instead. I chose the second approach, and keep that in mind as it might become relevant a little later on. Arriving at the mansion and beginning to explore, you'll come across a room containing no discernible paths forward and a big lever. If you're anything at all like me, you'll be unable to resist pulling it, at which point the entire room begins changing shape around you as Jindosh speaks to you over a tannoy. Using the newly formed stairs to proceed, mere moments later you come face to face with the man himself. I'd assume my involvement with the Duke brought you to my door. Or maybe your asshole washed up Anton Sokolov, comfortably residing in the assessment chamber. Either way, come find me and take whatever it is you seek. But if you fall, I'll have your body carried to my lab for dissection and study. And so begins your journey through the Clockwork Mansion proper. Not only do you have to contend with Dishonored's usual gameplay as you sneak or slice your way towards completing your objectives, but now you also have to consider how the environment itself might help or hinder your cause. It is a stunning twist on the series formula in so many ways. Visually, watching segments of rooms or indeed the entirety of them transform right before your eyes is jaw-dropping. You're able to observe every little detail as they whir and clank their way into position. It's attention to detail that's honestly seldom seen. Importantly, they also make sense in-world when you consider their usage. A dining table can be bought up to replace a pool table at the pull of a lever, and if you head down to where it came from, you'll realise it's connected to the kitchen so that staff can prepare dinner and then easily send it up to Jindosh and his guests. Two customers discuss their potential purchases in a waiting room nearby, which can be quickly lowered to an assessment area so that they can see the clockwork soldiers firsthand. A piano in the main hall can be swapped for an arc pylon, ensuring any nefarious guests can be prevented from reaching the mansion's all-important elevator. Even Jindosh's lab is designed to maximise space and improve efficiency, with different parts of it hidden below the floor, ready to be called up at a moment's notice. These are just a few examples, but the same goes for every other instance you might come across. They don't just look beautiful, they are also designed to be of real use to the mansion's occupants. They can be used to give you a tactical advantage as well. You can, for example, slip in between two transitioning rooms, which opens up additional safer pathways through the mansion, away from Jindosh's prying eyes. The colour palette in these areas consists predominantly of muted bluey greys, a far cry from the bright colourful areas you find yourself peering into from the shadows, and you may begin to feel like an actor taking a break backstage before the show continues, or a gamer who's no-clipped their way outside the intent boundaries of a level. Developer Arcane Studios has, of course, accounted for each and every one of your actions, but nevertheless it's hard not to still feel a sense of mischievousness as you creep around the edges of the mansion. 
experimentation outside of these boundaries is encouraged too, but you'll never find yourself trapped no matter how many levers you pull or buttons you press. There is always another nearby which will reset everything should you get yourself in a bit of a pickle. The layout of these areas is also kept tight and consistent, so that you can always gauge roughly where you are against the parts of the mansion intended for guests, which is made even easier by virtue of the many windows and other viewpoints which help orient you. Arcane also designed the mansion's map to be small to medium size, a wise choice, as many of Dishonored 2's sprawling environments are difficult enough to memorise without a new room shifting mechanic being introduced on top. Because of this focus on accessibility as well as style, soon enough you'll be gliding between the mansion's hallways and its hidden passages with gusto, discovering everything from the body and final words of an unfortunate soul who got trapped in this no man's land of sorts, to power supplies which can be used to open up new routes. As you unlock more of the mansion, its level design begins to function in a more circular manner too, making quickly moving between its various rooms and floors a far easier proposition the further you progress. In every conceivable way, the room shifting mechanic is absolutely phenomenal, and it remains one of the most memorable mechanics I've ever encountered. Before we move on, I also find comparisons between Dishonored 2 and Titanfall 2 to be really interesting, albeit quite coincidental. In my video covering Dishonored 2's time travel masterpiece, A Crack in the Slab, hit the card on screen now to watch it, I touched on the fact that both games released in 2016 and feature two of the best time travel missions in gaming, but what I didn't clock on to was that the similarities go even further. During the Clockwork Mansion, you can change the shape of the level as you see fit, and and in Titanfall 2's The Beacon, you can actually do similar to ensure you're never forced to slow down for too long. I find it bizarre both released in the same year and share multiple fairly unique concepts, and I'd highly recommend playing through both games to see how each developer made them work in their respective titles. After getting better acquainted with the mansion's layout, we arrive at the basement and a maze housing a single clockwork soldier, at the end of which lays Anton Sokolov. Can it be? Is that young Emily Caldwin? Anton, save your strength. I came to take you out of here. Jendosh has bigger plans than you know. An army of his clockwork soldiers. It would be the end. I'm going to visit Jindosh too, old friend. For the time being, we're going to take Sokolov back to where we entered the mansion and leave him to have a nap while we begin the hunt for Jindosh. Saving Sokolov is the trickier of your two objectives, I think, but it's the assassination portion of the Clockwork Mansion which really shows off its depth. If you've played Dishonored 2 or its predecessor, you'll know how many ways there are to tackle most challenges. You can be stealthy or clatter around like a bull in a china shop, you can kill everything in sight or choose to be a pacifist, and you can make use of every power available to you or use none of them at all. There are no right answers and it's entirely up to you how you approach any given situation. It could seem to some like that's not the case on this occasion though, with Jindosh keeping watch from afar, his guards patrolling, and his clockwork soldiers providing a formidable presence across the map, but there are still so many options, more than you will likely first suspect. Did you know that you can eliminate Jindosh without him ever realising you've entered the mansion? Rather than pulling the very first lever, you can instead leap above the room and enter the space behind the walls immediately. You can then stealth your way to Jindosh's private quarters, clamber around the outside of the building and enter his lab via a grate, remaining completely unseen the entire time. Jindosh will be sat working at his desk, unaware, protected by a single clockwork soldier it's easy enough to avoid as you tiptoe right up behind him. Him. It goes without saying that you can also do completely the opposite and go in loud, leaving every person and machine who confronts you in tatters as you blast your way towards your target. If you do decide to go the way of destruction and bloodshed, Jindosh will be guarded by not one but two clockwork soldiers when you arrive, and he himself will also be nervously circling the room, making dispatching him a trickier prospect than it would have been otherwise. My guess would be that the majority of those playing Clockwork Mansion, at least their first time through, will land somewhere in the middle of these two extremes. They'll pull the first lever and alert Jindosh, they'll attempt to be stealthy but sometimes get caught and have no choice but to fight or flee, and they'll spend a good while figuring out the map and exactly how everything within it works. 
While the other two approaches certainly have their charms, your first time muddling your way through the mission is undoubtedly one of those experiences that will make you fall in love with video games all over again. A unique mechanic means little if much of the rest of the game it's included in has to be stripped away in order to accommodate it. That is a completely reasonable piece of criticism some have levelled at later mission A Crack in the Slab, due to it taking away your abilities for the majority of its runtime, leaving only the time travel mechanic in their stead. The Clockwork Mansion, on the other hand, layers something new and exciting on top of what you've already come to expect from the franchise, and it's testament to Arcane's quality that they were able to combine such a complicated mechanic with Dishonored's multifaceted gameplay, which already places great value on player choice. Regardless of whether you went in all guns blazing or have been the most silent of assassins, you have a choice to make when you finally corner Jindosh. You can kill him and enjoy the immediate gratification of a job well done, or after solving a brief puzzle, you can use one of his own inventions against him, effectively eradicating his intelligence through the use of electroshock therapy. The second option is the less violent of the two, but after choosing it, you'll probably begin to question whether it's the more humane. And if I combine the acid against a copper plate, it... what does it do? I knew that a moment ago. Does anyone know the answer? Jindosh is a fascinating character, and I can't help but wonder whether Arcane at least in part took inspiration from Bioshock, the character of Sander Cohen and Fort Frolic, the area he presides over. The similarities between them are endless. Cohen often barks instructions at you or comments on your progress over your radio. No need to thank me for jamming the transmissions of those boors, Atlas and Ryan. Let them have their squabble. The artist, yes. The artist knows there is richer earth to till. While Jindosh does the same using the mansion's tannoy. Extraordinary. It seems that even two of my clockwork soldiers are no match for you. This has turned out to be a very interesting day. This pair of clips also serves to highlight just how alike their voices are too. The environments they govern also mirror their personalities. Sander Cohen is a reflection of the corrupting influence the city of Rapture often had on its most gifted inhabitants, and his macabre sculptures littering Fort Frolic serve as monuments to his madness. By comparison, Kirin Jindosh designed his clockwork mansion to showcase his genius and mastery of technology, the building itself acting as a sales tool of sorts designed to astonish customers. It is an intricate, complicated structure, much like the mind of the man himself, and it's guarded by clockwork soldiers programmed to speak using his voice, a constant reminder of how he's weaponized his brilliance. Even the music used during the level has shades of Bioshock about it too. Where the pair differ is in how the deaths of their antagonists, or lack of, are handled. At the end of Fort Frolic, Cohen will gift you with some supplies, and you can then choose whether to attack, although it's likely you'll simply decide to leave. The choice of what to do with Jindosh is far more nuanced, and it's one I don't think has a right answer. The man is dangerous, and killing him immediately removes him as an obstacle, both ensuring Emily's safe passage in the short term, and preventing issues with militarised robots and any other inventions he concocts in the longer term. It's the less harrowing option, and is quick and easy, but for me, it leaves a nagging doubt. I often wonder whether Jindosh could have perhaps been rehabilitated, his mind used to improve the lives of the downtrodden so huge in numbers throughout Dunwall. He may have strayed from the path of righteousness, so to speak, but he is by no means beyond redemption. The alternative is horrifying, but will also be justified to some. One particularly awful note written by Jindosh speaks of how he obliterated the memories and personality of a baker while keeping their ability to do their job intact, a fate he also intended for Sokolov. In his lab, you can also find the bodies and body parts of those he's been experimenting on as well. There can be no denying that Jindosh is not a good person, and if the philosophy of an eye for an eye is one you think is sometimes appropriate, enacting cruel and unusual punishment may be your preferred option. It has to be said, there is something poetic too about what might be the last lever you pull in the mansion ultimately being the one that transforms Jindosh himself as well. With everything pretty much done and dusted, it's time to return to the mansion's entrance where a napping Sokolov awaits. 
I've said many, many times, and hopefully it's been evident during this video too, that Arcane Studios are absolute masters when it comes to the little things, and there's a final detail I love that's very easy to miss directly after exiting the mansion. Remember earlier I told you to remember how I approached the mansion, that I relied on Emily's powers instead of using a carriage? Well, you might think it's strange then that there's one waiting for you regardless. Unless, that is, you pickpocket the man standing around nearby carrying a note from his master telling him to wait until he's finished his business. It's a really clever way of ensuring a carriage is still available to extract Sokolov, even if you never used one in the first place. At last, meeting back up with Megan Foster at your rendezvous point, the Clockwork Mansion, concludes. You did it. How is he? He's frail and wounded, but he'll recover. I didn't think it was possible. You must have a story to tell. I'll hear it back at the ship. Arcane Studios' imagination and the attention to detail that's always on display within their worlds is a big part of why I love their games so much, and everything I love about the studio is present during the Clockwork Mansion. It takes a concept some developers might have struggled with and executes it with ease, creating some of the most visually striking, ingenious environments ever seen. At the same time, none of the choices on offer during the usual Dishonored 2 fair have been taken away either, and that combination of innovation and consistency is a real winner. The Clockwork Mansion is one of the best video game levels I've ever played, and if you've never tried it but fancy giving it a go, I'd say now is the perfect time. Thanks for watching the video, boys, girls and assassins. If you had a cracking time, do consider liking, subscribing and letting me know what you think of the Clockwork Mansion, and fingers crossed we'll catch up again soon.